Hi, this is Chad Cook from Cider Hill Farm and Cellars in Amesbury, Massachusetts. And you are listening to Cider Chat. Episode 104. Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Aria Windcaller, and I am the producer and host of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. And this week, we have an in-depth, detailed piece on cider making with a Chad Cook of Cider Hill Cellars. There'll be more on that chat in just a moment. Well, it's about time we roll out the Totally Cider Travel Trip to the UK. Yep, indeed, I've been speaking about it, and now I'm inviting you directly to come on along. We'll be there April 25th to May 2nd, spot on in the middle of blossom time. Walking through the orchards, meeting up in Bristol, which is like a hub center. There's a lot of cool cider shops there. Can't wait to hang out with you having the ultimate cider experience. I I, I get like, I don't know, shivery inside just thinking about how fun that's going to be. We're going to stay at a, a boutique hotel that has, check this out, three air streamers on the roof. Who's going to get in the air streamer? We'll be finding out. And that view up there overlooks the city. That's going to be fantastic. Then we head down south into Somerset and visit Sheppies and Perry's and Thatcher's. Uh, we're going to see Neil Worley. Neil did a chat here on Keeving. He's fantastic. He mentioned a place that he recommended for lunch So we're going there. Then we'll have the weekend in Bath, and there'll be some downtime that you could do some sightseeing so you don't get totally saturated on cider. I know that's like a hard concept, but having traveled a little bit, I really wanted to hone this trip so you have a nice balance of both cider and getting into the culture. Because the two go together. It has to be the food, the people, and the cider. That really brings out the essence of an area so you get an understanding of why they're moving towards certain methods, why they have certain viewpoints on cider and the traditions there that might really differ from where you're at. This is offered to everyone out in Ciderville. You don't have to be a U.S. resident to be part of this trip. If you're on the other side of the puddle, come on along. Just go to totallycider.com and you'll be able to find the info on the itinerary and register today. Again, that is totallycider.com and I can't wait to hang out with you then out in the orchards during blossom time. Well, you are up for a humdinger of an, a chat here with a maker that's kind of new on the block. Let me give you a little bit of background story before we begin. I was invited to attend a meeting with the Boston Wart Processors. Wart is spelled W-O-R-T. And wart is what you call that baseline liquid once you've done the mashing for making beer. Uh, In winemaking, you call it must, and in beer, you call it wart. It's that initial piece before it really starts fermenting. In essence, though, this is a group of fermenters, and they make beer, whatever ferments, they make it. Lovely group of people. We met up on the hillside overlooking Cider Hill Farm, and that scene was happening. There was apples. They had all these kid activities, and across the way you could see the orchards rising up on the hill, thus a Cider Hill, right? This is a family, multi-generational family. You'll hear a little bit about that. And I got to have a walk and talk with Chad Cook, who is a new maker on the cider scene. I so enjoyed his detailed uh, tips, I guess you might say, on cider making. I really think there's a lot of value in this chat. I tasted his ciders. They were absolutely delicious. I hope you get a chance to try them too. He's hot off uh, Wynn 
at the 2014 Franklin County Cider Days. There, I said it, the full word, Franklin County Cider Days competition. Uh, that will be, actually, I think the competition um, judging is going to be coming up on December 2nd for this year. But he won a gold medal. And that's no small you know, prize indeed, because there's good cider makers at that competition. Uh, I sure know that. So bravo for that. And that inspired him to continue on and look at the apples on his family's farm and say, hey, let's do this cidery. Um, a little background uh, on on the folks here is uh, his grandparents had an orchard and his parents had an orchard. And now Chad is in the cidery. So it's pretty cool stuff. There's some nice photos at ciderchat.com. Just go to episode 101. Make sure you have your glass in hand. And as always, if your hands are on the wheel and you're going down the road, keep it slow and steady. And if you're riding that bike, keep the pedal smooth and watch out for the bumps. (laughs) Hey, let's all just grab a glass now and join this chat with Chad Cook of Cider Hill Cellars in Amesbury, Massachusetts. I see all the apple trees over there. Um, I was, you know, kind of doing a little back- background research, and I saw that your folks um, kind of uh, integrated the two farms, your grandparents' farm, like 120 acres, right? Yeah, 130. 130, I believe, on okay. On this side and 15 on this side. On this side, wow, back and back, wow. Yeah, so this across the street right here was owned by the Battis family for a long, long time. And it's 39 years ago now that my grandfather retired from his career in physics and wanted to just get into something wow. for fun. And he always loved gardening when he was younger, so he he bought this property and planted a few trees and some strawberries and stuff, and in front of the old dairy barn here, set up an honesty box, essentially. Nice. And and he was just ready to be on cruise control for the rest of his life. And my dad and my mom, 37 years ago, bought this side of the farm. It was an old chicken farm owned by the Pedrani family. I see. And they planted our first orchard on their honeymoon... I read that. It's so lovely. (laughs) Like, what was that about? Because they were spending their honeymoon on the farm because they had a farm. They didn't didn't go anywhere. They had $500 to their name. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They they couldn't really do anything for a while. Yeah. So my dad, he had studied agriculture at a couple different universities and really wanted to do it for a living. Mm -hmm. He just loved farming in the outdoors and he sort of picked that up from my grandfather always having a garden when he was younger. After a few years, Carriage Town Orchards, as this side was called, the other side was Cider Hill Farm. It just got too big. We needed more land. The two businesses were directly competing with each other, and my dad and my mom wanted to enter a partnership with my grandparents. So we merged businesses. The whole thing is called Cider Hill Farm. And I guess it's it's just over the years through my parents' unbelievably hard work grown into what it is today. I could tell that. So you've been doing orcharding since you were born, essentially. You've been part of, like, the apple orchard from the beginning. I guess, you know, I grew up around all of this, but my parents never had the requirement that my brother and I, I have an older brother who's two years older, that we work here. They wanted whatever we did in life to be what made us happy and then what we were passionate about. Mm -hmm. So when I was 16, I I started working on the farm um, for two reasons. One, because... I, I really love this place. I wouldn't say agriculture is my passion. It's something I enjoy because, I mean, look at this. It's beautiful. Beautiful and yeah. so much happiness. I just want to, like, let the <laughs> listeners know what we're doing right now. So we've just walked down from the hill where the Boston Warp Processors are having their meeting, came down to the area through this full parking lot, and into this just... It's like a playland of, uh, well, fall festivities right now. I'm looking out in the distance, and people are walking up this trail up the hill. What's up there in the distance? Okay, so that is more apple trees. There's corn on the flat before you get up to the hill. But the farm, actually just about from where this little bridge is that you see people walking over real close to us, 
once you get up to the top of the hill, it goes about the same distance again over the back side. Nice. Yeah. And yeah, I could see it goes all the way up top through the orchards. Are, are people doing like self-picking up there? or? Yeah, or we do a lot of pick your own. Pick your own, okay. And then there's all these like pumpkins here. A little stand, it says Cider Hill Cellars Hard Cider Tasting. And then there's a, a food uh, truck here, or is that part of your operation right yeah, here? That's, that's a food truck. We just got it in this June. I got it ready to open this June, I should say. And my brother is working in there right now. And what do you? What kind of food do you serve in there? Right now, it's just real simple. It's it's chili and hot dogs, French fries. What else do you need? You know, when you're out on the farm. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. We're we're just getting everybody trained up to operate it efficiently right now but in the future we're going to try and switch to a much more farm centric menu using more from our farm you know right now we're doing lemonade and you can have our fruit blended into it and we sell this ice cream that has our own fresh fruit blended into it it's fantastic is that like the apple um blended into i saw something on yelp where there was like a photo of a waffle cone Mm -hmm. with a uh ice cream is that what you're serving wow that it's that made me drool just looking at it in the car i'm like forget (laughs) anything else i need one of those but yeah i can feel like the pace it's like picking up since um oh yeah you you probably kicked into gear with the making the cider and that's like added a whole other dimension to it yeah definitely this year we introduced the food trailer and hard cider (laughs) and i every year we get to the end of the season and everybody's worn out and we're thinking okay we're done we're just gonna get better what we're already doing we won't expand anymore and then winter comes and everybody gets bored and spring rolls around and we've got four more things that we're going to try and do again and <laughs> it just never stops. Wow, wow, that's yeah. amazing. So you have this a little separate here. We're up a little bit higher on the hill and this says Cider Hill Cellars Tasting yeah. so people could come up here and have a sample and, and then buy your product. Yeah, we have free samples of everything. I've never really enjoyed going to wineries and having to pay $5 for three little sips and I don't know, the joy of owning a place is that you get to make it exactly what your favorite place would be. Right. Yeah. So uh, right now we only have two because we've sold out of just about everything else this season, but we have a fully dry cider and an ice style cider. We have to call it a frost cider because it doesn't get naturally cold enough in Massachusetts to Mm -hmm. do it outdoors every year, but Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to consistently produce, so I built a giant walk-in freezer and we'll press our juice and freeze it using artificial cold, so hence frost cider. A lot of people do that around the world. It's kind of like part of the the factors that come in. It still tastes good, I guarantee it. I'm sure it tastes good. <laughs> and it's interesting that you have um, the dry cider as the, the one that hasn't sold out yet because the palate, that always tells me the palate is still catching up to what cider could really be. Yeah, and yeah. I, I did not expect it to sell very well. But if I did this, I wanted to eventually show people what real cider is. You know, unfortunately... I wanted to be doing this five years ago, not opening up this year. And the licensing oh, takes a long, long yes, time. Yeah, yeah. And I got very, very sick a couple of years ago and couldn't work for a year. Oh. Yeah, but we're in it now, and a couple other larger producers, and especially the, the ultra-large producers, Stella makes the cider, and, you know, there's, um, what is it, Smith & Forge is owned yep. by BMC, yep, I think. Yep, yep. Hi, buddy. But... The American palate is sweet, and mass market ciders now are super sweet. Yes, they are. Yeah. And so yeah. what we have to do is introduce something, market it for a couple yeah. of years as local, and then hopefully over time introduce more ciders on the dry spectrum than we do on the sweet spectrum. Absolutely. And a, 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 somebody in Ciderville listening right now, those of us who are totally geeked out on it, that's the first bottle that you know I would think I would want to take home as a dry cider mm-hmm. because that's going to tell me that terroir that we were talking about earlier. You know, it's going to just immediately tell me what you've been doing on your property here, your grandparents to your parents and the new generation coming in. Um, yeah, you're going to taste your your land in the glass. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when you, when you do this as a hobby, you get to make exactly what you want and not worry about it. But when you do it commercially, you need to make what people want to drink, right not on. just yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And we find that sweet sells, but I still get to pull it back a little bit. So we don't sell a sweet cider. We sell a semi-sweet for our yeah. sweet offer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we get away with that. People still like it. And a lot of people are coming to us. Actually, almost everybody who tries it and they say, I like this so much more than the mass market ones because they are too sweet. And maybe, you know, maybe we can do like an off dry sometime and yeah, 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 a little yeah. more. <laughs> I think it's going to change though, Chad, because, you know, uh, 
I've had the same experience for like 20 years around cider in that people are, are having that fresh pressed juice, the sweet cider, right, that's not fermented. And so in their mind, they're thinking that fermented apple juice should taste sweet. So it's like they don't, there's a disconnect. So I don't think it's, it's somewhat the palate, and the Americans do have a sweet palate, but they're still catching up with what we all want to, you know, bring it to. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah. yeah, certainly when giving a tasting, I'll always ask people, have you had hard cider before? And when you get the answer, no, the next question I always ask people is, does wine taste like grapes? And no, it doesn't. And then I say, okay, so use that expectation. Does hard cider taste like apples? Not quite like you're expecting. Now we can drink it. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good approach to go. Yeah, perfect. Cider Hill Farm, and the best of luck. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. Lovely. So let's see. So I'm going to look at this glass here. Chad just brought over. This is the dry cider. You, do you just call it dry cider? Is that the name of it? or? We have fanciful names for them. This one we call spring. Spring to me is cool. It's dry. Mm -hmm. So the weather's a little bit chilly still. I don't know, there's there's just a frigid nature oh. to it. I thought it matched well with the thought of an American style yeah. dry cider. Now look at that. It's, it's a, a, a very light straw color and the nose is really pronounced too. Wow, you're really getting a nice apple. It is primarily what you consider eating apples. I. I call them heritage eating apples. It's more of the older ones, the Northern Spy, mm -hmm. yep. Macallan, things that yep. have been around for a long. We're not putting Gala, Honeycrisp, the, the ones that people think would make a really right. good cider who have never had it. Yeah, but you know, you have that nice little tartness that will come with that culinary mm -hmm. type of um, apple. Um, dry, I love the nose. I actually really find that is true with the, the non-cider apples. You get that nose in a way that you don't necessarily get with cider apples. And you're using uh, a yeast in here, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, you, are you doing any wild ferment in the future or, or now? Are you thinking about doing that at all? For every batch, we tend to do a partial wild fermentation. Okay. So we do what do you press, mean by that? We'll, we'll press fresh cider mm -hmm. and we will sulfite, but we won't sulfite up to 0.8 parts per million molecular sulfite. We'll go up to 0.4 mm -hmm. for our initial one. And that will inhibit most lactic acid bacteria. Mm -hmm and botanomyces as well, mm -hmm. but we're not necessarily killing off all the apiculate or wild saccharomyces yeasts. And so we'll let it get up to maybe half a percent or one percent alcohol content sometimes before we even introduce our own yeast. Your own yeast and yeah. we, we do use yeast with competitive factors, so I can pretty much guarantee that the moment it takes mm -hmm. off, it's going to kill everything else that's in there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I guess I couldn't prove it to you right now, but I just have the belief that wild fermentation is not necessarily a bad thing in a small amount, and it could serve to add some complexity to the cider. Oh, absolutely. In fact, the way you make cider, is the way I taught cider making for years at Cider Days. Um, well, a, a little bit backwards. I I never sulfite it. I would get a fresh pressed juice, and I would be doing a cider demo, so I wouldn't put any sulfite in it. Mm -hmm. I, I felt it was kind of a, a couple factors, and that's what I feel here at Cider Hill Farm. Is like there's a certain vitality of the people that are here and your your connection to the land. So I would just pop in that that yeast right then and let the wild yeast and the yeast that I was putting in commune together mm -hmm. and have faith in that and it really uh, this tastes much like what I would experience from New Salem what I would make there many years that really delightful bouquet that comes through it's like it tastes like a classic kind of New England cider to me I know people call they have a, a descriptor of a New England cider yeah. But this, terroir-wise, is what a classic New England cider tastes like to me. Awesome. With that land and um, that tartness and that, yeah, really nice, really nice. Well, you can come by anytime. This is great. <laughs> All right. Well, my pleasure. And what are you getting for, like, an ABV here? 8%. 8%. Wow. So you started with a pretty high gravity. Yeah. Yeah. I want every cider of ours, of this category, the, the gently sparkling, 
more to be drank, like a wine cider, to be at least 8% alcohol. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to make something underneath that. And part of that is because TTB regulations at 7% go over to FDA regulations, and mm -hmm. it gets tricky to work with, and mm -hmm. I, I don't want to ride that line too closely. Um, what do you think is but also, um, in the American market, you know, in, in France, you can get a Keeve cider that's 3.8% alcohol. I know, I and, love that. And, and, <laughs> and people will still pay full price for a bottle because they're buying it for the flavor, but people in America like the octane behind it. They want alcoholic power, and getting a buzz is is part of what our culture perceives value right. to be. Yeah. So yeah. If, I'm, yeah. if I'm selling our cider at wine prices, which we do, this is $14 a bottle, I think part of the consumer expectation is that they get a wine buzz. Right. Yeah. But also, having more alcohol in the ciders does tend to add more body to it. Mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. you can you can get alcohol in there to a point before you taste mm -hmm. it, especially if you select the right yeast for that, to not produce the heavier alcohols mm -hmm. and the fusel oils that give you that hot vodka flavor. And I think working with the culinary apples too it it makes sense also versus the cider blends I, I don't think you have to bring it up so high I want to go back to just be really clear so listeners know what you're talking about with the FDA and bringing it down a little bit lower uh, if you're going for a lower ABV it's because of, of what there what are you talking about specifically it's labeling regulations and so if it was below Right now, the as of 2017, you can make an 8.5 percent cider and not be taxed any higher as a wine, and that just happened with the Cider Act in 2017. Yep. You're saying going below 7 percent, you're going to have to do what on the label? So then we have to change to a food label mm -hmm. and operate by FDA guidelines, which is caloric content, sugar content, ingredients listing. Mm -hmm. It looks like a can of soda yeah. more than it does a bottle right. of cider. And it's 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 difficult mostly because on any given year, whoever wrote the laws didn't know a thing about apples because on a given year I can pick the same variety and yeah. it will give me a seven and a half percent or a six and a half percent alcohol cider. That's right. Yeah. So we we have to play some tricks with this to get it to be eight percent every time. Yeah. 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 But it's really simple the way that we do it right you know as I'm I'm the after you know the the mouthfeel afterward I get the astringency and it's uh it's delightful is that people should know when I'm saying that I'm saying like you know it's like drying in your mouth but it really opens up the minerality of your soil and that and that's what I like looking for so I want something that is really just true to your land mm -hmm. in that way yeah, I, I think a lot of people, when they start off, they try and get really, really fancy. Uh, a lot of the larger cider producers, they're making spiced ciders and cranberry ciders and uh, whatever, I guess, because they can only buy one kind of juice, and they're getting it from large commercial cider mills. They don't get to create their own blend, but where we get to create a blend, I wanted to make sure before we did try and maybe break into that flavored cider market that we had a clean base product to work with. That's, a, that's pretty wise. Why not? Because then you know what your base is, and then you could mm -hmm. go from there. Um, yeah, I think that's brilliant. I, I always think it's really good, too, for every cidery that is, like, orchard-based to have a wild cider. So then that you will really know what your terroir is. Mm -hmm. You know, just go with that. And, and then from there, then you could kind of start playing around. But at least you know what the earth is saying to you from the beginning or the apple trees. Yeah, I've, you know, obviously in small scale batches made completely wild fermented ciders mm -hmm. before and they're fantastic. They're perfectly clean. They're delicious. They retain plenty of apple flavor, but I'm, I'm scared to do that on a commercial scale just in case there is Britannomyces or something in there. Mm. And instead of being able to sell a wine like cider, I sell a very, very different cider. From. God, I love that Britannomyces, so I love it. <laughs> I love it. To me, yeah. when I hear that, I just that's exactly what I want. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think, you know, in time, you know, you're, you're, you're just starting. I mean, this is, when, when did you first sell commercially? May. Well, May. May. So this we're, year. we are, you know, super, super early on here, yeah. you know? Uh, so I'll be curious to kind of catch up with you in a couple of years and see. But you know, you're running out the door uh, full speed. So you have the dry. Mm hmm. You have the frost cider. Yes. What is the ABV on that? It's twelve and a half percent. Twelve and a half. So you're just right inside that that wine. You know, I consider like wine eleven percent as a base and going up. Mm -hmm. A lot of ice ciders, quote unquote, are a little bit higher, like seventeen percent and even higher. Yeah. So. 
can you tell us a little bit about that? Why are you going for like shooting that level? So I got all of my favorite. <laughs> he smiled just then. I could tell there was a, more of a story behind that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went out for a couple of years actually up to Quebec and all throughout Vermont and any liquor store I could find here that carried it and purchased every ice cider I could find and drank all of them, found my favorite ones, and then ran them through the lab that I have to test their pH, acid content, sugar content, mm -hmm. yes. everything. And then with the ice cider regulations in the United States and Canada, you are required to list your original bricks on the label. Mm. So I knew the juice people were starting with, and I knew where they were finishing with it, and essentially just reverse engineered what I thought would be a really good cider. So I set up a graph with, um, you know, sweetness versus acid content, and mm -hmm. then the perception of balance would be the line that I would run up the middle of it. Mm. And I just found that, I don't know if I should say the numbers on this, I found that there were numbers <laughs> that made my favorite ice cider, and so we, we simply copied that. Can you say a little bit about the numbers? Because everybody now is like yeah, I know. screaming their ear to like the phone. What, 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 what's the numbers? Yeah, so you know, you're looking for grams per liter of malic acid in a mm -hmm. cider, and mm -hmm. then you're looking for grams per liter of sugar. And your typical ice cider ends up at about 150 grams per liter of sugar. And a lot of them, they'll range anywhere between 9.5 and, and 17 grams per liter of malic acid. And once you get up above, like, 13 grams per liter malic acid, it starts to get more tart than sweet. The balance is thrown off, and you're definitely heading more towards something that makes you pucker. Mm. Where when you dip below 11% mm -hmm. malic acid, you're going to end up with a really, really robust, velvety, almost sticky sugar aftertaste to it. It lingers in your mouth. And so it, it depends on how you want people to be drinking it. If you want it to be a pure dessert cider and you're having it with cheesecake, maybe with like a tart fruit on top of it like raspberry, then you could go with one of the sweet ice ciders and just blow the whole thing out of proportion with even more sugar. But if you're having it as a dessert, which is essentially the only way ice cider is drank, I think if you were having that with more of a dry pastry or something, I'd pick mm -hmm. something more tart mm -hmm. to balance out the fats that would be in that. And so we did a bunch of test batches of ice ciders, and I started off by making one with a low acid content, sharing it with all of our employees. It was nine and a half grams per liter of malic mm -hmm. acid. You're going to get me to talk about this now. <laughs> oh, I love that. No, please do. Uh, this is exactly what we want to hear. Yeah. And everybody tried it, and they liked it, and it actually won the gold medal at Franklin County Cider Days, but everybody said it was still too sweet. It, it wasn't balanced, and I bought malic acid powder, and we added it in pretty much 0.1 or 0.2 grams per liter at a time until we got up to 11.5 grams per liter of malic acid, and that's when everybody said, okay, this is the perfect balance. Yeah. But what we found is that malic acid powder does not incorporate the exact same way that natural malic acid does. So our final ice cider is more than 11.5 grams per liter of malic acid because mm -hmm. the natural stuff doesn't have as strong of an impact. Mm -hmm. it, it stays mm -hmm. more balanced for longer. It kind of hangs out in the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. So I I'd actually have to go look at the numbers to guarantee this, but this is somewhere right around 13.5 or 14 grams per liter of malic acid with... I believe we stopped this right at 15 bricks, but it might be 16 to help balance out the acid a little mm -hmm. bit better. And how did, how did you stop it? How do you, how do you do that with your ice cider? Because I know some people playing with that have a little have, have had a little difficulty. Mm -hmm. So we selected a yeast that is not entirely cold tolerant, but it does not throw off flavors when it gets to be cold. Mm -hmm. It simply slows down. Mm -hmm. And we'll start the fermentation. We use Go Firm Protect when we start every one of our ciders mm -hmm. as a rehydration nutrient, mm -hmm. and that gets them started. But um, we also use Firm 8 as a yeast nutrient, mm -hmm. yeah. and we divide the dose between 24 hours after the start of fermentation or after pitching yeast, I'd have to... Hey, Jonathan. Hey, when we use a Fermate O oh, first dose, is that 24 hours after pitching or 24 hours after start of visible fermentation? 24 hours after... Pitching, right? Pitching, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Jonathan. My name's Rhea Wincaller. Jonathan, nice to meet you. I heard that you're a cider maker here too, eh? Yes. Cool. Yeah. Just talking about the frost cider and uh, the how to stop the fermentation. Right. Um, is that is that pretty popular? Are you finding? Oh, away, are, are you finding? Yeah, people really go for that because there's that that sweet factor. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would grab a bottle of that and want to have it with some really nice cheeses for dessert. Oh yeah. You know, on a cheese plate. 
you know, ooh, talk about cutting through all the... And what, what kind of bl- blend of apples are you using in that? So I have found that my favorite ice ciders come entirely from Northern Spy. Oh. Like, if I could make an ice cider with just Northern Spy, that would be huh. awesome. Why? Well, it, say more about that. When you bite into a Northern Spy, it... You know, when you when you make a hard cider, I think a lot of people think sweet apples are going to be delicious, but they're not keeping in mind that all that sugar that makes that tasty turns into alcohol. Mm. It's gone. And what you're left with is you're left with the character of the apple that's more like the spicy or the floral, mm-hmm. whatever's in the tiny little bit of skin that you get. Mm-hmm. And Northern Spy, when you bite into one, they're, they're sweet and they're tart. They have a really nice balance, which... The tartness does remain in the final cider, but they're spicy. Mm-hmm. The Northern Spy is a really nice, spicy character to it, and mm. that carries over as apple flavor. Yeah, nice. Well said. Well said. And so, that's not Northern Spy. That's not Northern Spy, though. Nope. <laughs> is there any Northern Spy in there? No, because <laughs> because Northern Spy is an incredibly strong biennial producer. You okay. either you pretty much have it or you don't. Right, so right. this year we have a monster Northern Spy crop. We, this is actually the largest apple harvest we have ever had on our farm. It's been a good in, year in, in the region. 39 yeah. years, yeah. Wow. And so thank wow. thank God we have this cidery open this year because we're going to press 4,500 gallons and fill all of our fermenters. And then we're going to freeze up another 4,000 gallons and use that for ice cider and maybe for a couple fruit-infused batches in the springtime where the freezing won't ruin the flavor too much because wow. there will be more wow. to mask any deficiencies with uh, things like raspberries in there for example so. did you were you able to get okay, your apples harvested or, or you picked up the drops um, with that really 90 degree weather that happened in September did that impact your harvesting at all or did you have any crop loss or anything around that no we actually haven't had any crop loss our season is going forever Great. Usually Fantastic. we'll have had a frost by now, but mm-hmm. I mean it's it's seventy, it's going to be seventy five degrees today. Yeah, we're talking on uh, what is it, October twenty first? Yeah, twenty second maybe. Twenty second, twenty second. I'll go with that. Twenty well, second. I don't 22nd. know. Twenty second. Yeah, yeah, right yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and I'm wearing a t-shirt. It's I know. It's terribly wrong, and climate change terrifies me. This is not normal. Yeah. The warm weather's awesome now. It's awful in the springtime because the apple trees are starting to bloom earlier every year, but we're still getting cold snaps. Yeah, I know. And there's there's a risk of crop loss in the future, but for yeah. this season, right now, I'll take it. The blend that goes into there, I'm looking for apples that you wouldn't traditionally think are made with apples to produce hard cider. And we're talking about the spicy flavor that's in Northern Spy, and mm-hmm. things like that are important. You want your apple to have character, but what makes right. a good dry cider does not make a good ice cider. Right. I don't want tannin at all mm-hmm. in there. Hmm. And, you know, when, when you concentrate mm-hmm. an ice cider, your original juice ends up somewhere at four times the initial concentration. That's right. So, you know, your your average dry English-style cider, we'll call it, with tannic apples like Davenet and the Arlington Mill has somewhere around three grams per liter of tannin. Yeah. And an eating apple can have up to half a gram per liter of tannin. So if you concentrate that four times, you end up with something with a tannic content that makes a great dry cider, but in a dessert cider, and the sweetness with the tannin just overwhelms. It's not that great. Mm-hmm. And so we'll go through, and we'll take Macintosh and not necessarily delicious. I don't like that apple. Do Almost. you have many delicious We grow trees? them because everybody thinks they're their favorite. Wow, still. But we grow 90 varieties of apples here, <coughs> somewhere right around Jeez. there. And if 90 you, varieties, that's pretty darn good. Yeah. I'll always ask people, what do you like about the delicious? Do you like the texture, or the sweetness, or the thickness of the skin, and how hard you have to bite into it? And, <laughs> and then we'll Let's give them something. The shelf. Yeah, we'll give them something, and they instantly like it better. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, we'll put Macintosh, Macallan, uh, Northern Spy is great in ice cider. You can do Mutsu, but it is pretty acidic, so mm-hmm. we're mm-hmm. careful with that. But eating apples, really nice, neutral, apple flavor. Eating yeah. apples. Up in, up in Quebec, they use Spartan. Mm-hmm. for every single ice cider just about because it stays on the trees and freezes really well and when you eat it it tastes a lot like a Macintosh mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so y- you want tannin free apples for ice cider and you know speaking about a balance between sweetness and acidity you also have to keep in mind that your acid content is going to increase about four times through the freezing process yeah when you use natural cold um, I'm sorry I'm getting a little off track no no you're but, doing great but when you use natural cold to freeze an ice cider which 
definitely would be the way to do it if you can because mm -hmm. that's just exciting and mm -hmm. neat and a cool part of history but it doesn't really get cold enough to influence the malic acid content but you can precipitate malic acid out of cider when you get it cold enough and the walk-in freezer that we built you is get it cold enough. we can get it cold enough so yeah. we make a blend that is a little higher than the acid content we would want to have and some of it will drop out when we freeze the cider mm -hmm. but typically in your home freezer or something you're not going to get that so speaking about the range between 9 and you know 14 15 grams per liter of malic acid if you are testing TA you'll want to find an apple therefore that has somewhere between 3 grams per liter and five grams per liter of malic acid, which most eating apples will get right in that range. Yeah. But we have to be careful not to use something that's really tart. Like if we used a spy gold, those tested out extremely acidic at and ten and a half grams too, per liter. Too tart. Yeah, I don't want an ice cider that has forty grams yeah, per liter of yeah. acid unless I want to support my local dentists because I've, everybody's I've teeth are melting. Ice, I've had those kind of <laughs> ice ciders too, yeah. 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 Well, that was, that's really great information for folks who are really trying that. And there's a lot of commercial cideries that do make ice cider to different effects and um, some good tips there. So those culinary mm -hmm. apples are key, and that's why we're seeing a lot of ice cider makers in the, um, the area of Sweden and Norway, kicking up with Denmark, yeah. a lot of ice cider, yeah. And, of course, we could kind of thank Eleanor up at... Um, uh, Eden's ice yeah. cider, yeah. you know, she's just kind of like the the mother of ice cider in the U.S. Yep. and uh, and she's been she's just an amazing maker. I'm hoping to get up there this winter to see her in the middle of her ice cider making experience. Awesome. Yeah, lovely person. Yep. She actually helped me a couple times when I'm I sure was she did. making this at home. I emailed her and she was helpful enough to write back. Yeah. And it really. Yeah, she's awesome. I I've know. never met her in person, but I am a fan. <laughs> she's the warmest ice cider maker I've ever met. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and a beautiful smile too. Yay! So we have the dry. We have the we have the spring, which is your dry cider. Yeah. We have the frost. Do you call it frost it's, cider? It's winter, winter frost cider. Winter frost cider. Yeah. So we go with the seasonal theme for our mm -hmm. permanent cider: spring, summer, autumn, and winter. So let's talk about the su summer. Yep, summer is a semi-sweet cider. Mm -hmm. So for for the spring, can I talk about spring first? Please, please. All right, I can lead into summer this way. Okay. Speaking of apple blends, for spring where it's a fully dry cider, if you make a hard cider with what we use for the ice cider, just purely culinary apples, they tend to come out really thin and really tart. And that's what a lot of home-brewed hard ciders taste like that mm -hmm. I've had. And they, they're never quite what you want them to be. I was never happy with my early attempts. And... For a fully dry cider, I like to have at least a few apples in here with tannin content. You know, we're, we're going to make autumn eventually, which I want to be more of an English-style dry cider, mm. which to me means lower acid content. Mm -hmm. Right now, spring is a higher acid content cider. And to prevent that with no sugar whatsoever in here from just being sour, about 10% of this blend is made using tannic apples. Mm. And Interesting. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. So the the base of this is a blend between Macowan, Spiegel, Cortland, Northern Spy, uh, just about seven different common eating mm -hmm. apples. But mm -hmm. again, more of the ones with spicy character and actual mm -hmm. flavor to them because mm -hmm. that's what we grow on the farm right now. Right. You know, we're still waiting for our true cider orchards to come online. Probably next year we have 600 trees that we've planted purely for making hard cider with, and that's all the more traditional varieties, the Davenet, mm -hmm. the Arlington mm -hmm. Mill, Kingston Black, Harrison, yeah, whatever. And when did those cider apples start getting planted? Those, we started five years ago. Five years ago. Actually, okay. six, years, six years ago now. So you're just starting to see some of your your crop, and you probably had a good crop this year, or a good harvest, or... Yeah, the, <laughs> we planted 100 trees five years ago, and in the past two years, we planted 500 more. And that first 100 that we planted, the first two years in a row got hit by deer in the wintertime and got set back a year both times. So we're really just starting to get full harvests out of those. Ooh, it's so annoying. Darn. We have a really good deer fence now, so that's not a problem anymore. Oh, I was anymore. wondering, yeah. yeah. I mean, you have so many apple trees here, I would have thought that you probably have a couple of great Pyrenees out there to keep them back. We, I mean, we keep our mind. Yeah, we've pretended to be them before and chased deer out mm. numerous times every winter. Wow. Yeah, but we're, we're all set these days. So with the spring, that first hundred trees of more traditional cider apples and heirloom American varieties mm -hmm. found their way into this blend. Yeah, so there's yeah. 
there's Ashmead's Kernel and Espa Spitzenberg and Wixen's Crab mm, all lovely. in here. Yeah, yep. yeah. Yeah, so quite a few different apples in just one little glass. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important for anybody who's never been out in the orchard to understand what it takes to bring that apple into the glass. It is not easy. It's not, oh, just pick the, the apple. It's not what's hanging there. you got to go up into the tree. Are you picking apples, or do you shake it? How do you get your oh, apples out of there? Hand-picked, for sure. Okay. Yeah, if you have a spur-bearing variety or even a tip-bearing variety and you shake the tree to harvest, you're going to pull a lot of spurs and branch tips off with them. Mm -hmm. And, like, sure, an apple with a leaf hanging from it looks great on the shelf, mm, but, but the, yeah. the bud for next year is right at the base of that leaf and so yeah. you're, you're really hurting your trees yeah, when you do that yeah, yeah. yeah handpicked we don't even give our uh, pick your own customers pole pruners here oh, okay. we go through with ladders and we pick the top halves of the trees for and our are own these all store. standard sized trees uh, or, they're, no. they're all at least semi dwarfs okay yep well that helps a lot yeah definitely um, okay, so I don't want to go too far off task here, so <laughs> no, no, that's okay. <laughs> it's part of what happens, and it's beautiful. Anything else you'd like to say about spring? Yeah, for the most part, just for a dry cider, I'd recommend trying to pick some apples that are more astringent. Not acidic, but astringent. Mm -hmm. and, and get them in there. It, it just helps give it body yeah. and balance it out a little yeah, bit yeah. better. And if you can't get those apples then you're mm -hmm. going to a cidery to try to find good juice you know and, yeah. and typically a, a, the cidery will tell you exactly what's in that blend yeah and I, I think if you absolutely cannot get away with finding maybe lower acid apples or something with tannin i'd use a like a malic acid reducing yeast mm -hmm. like something like lalvin 71b mm -hmm. Perfect will, yeast. yeah if you ferment colder with it you'll reduce like 15 percent of your malic acid if you mm -hmm. do a hotter fermentation i think it can do up to 40 percent mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and so if you don't have tannin to balance out the acid just lower the acid mm -hmm. and then a slow cool fermentation mm -hmm. don't I, mean, I used to make it and just put it right next to my wood stove yeah. when i was first starting cider making <laughs> and then i was just like well all my cider's tasting so harsh and really uh, alcoholic. Um, yeah, so low, smooth fermentation through the whole process. And what's your start to finish for, like, the spring? You, it's How long are you before bottle? It's about 10 weeks. 10 weeks? Yeah, so the fermentation itself is two, two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. the, the active fermentation, mm -hmm. you know, we, well, I'll just walk you through it. Sure. Yeah, sure. So we'll, we'll pick our blend and we'll press the cider mm -hmm. and put it directly into a fermenter from the press. At that point we will sulfite to probably 0.4 parts per million molecular and our apples are chilled when they are pressed so the cider mm -hmm. comes out of the press at about 46 degrees Fahrenheit mm -hmm. and we want to do a cooler fermentation and we're using an introduced yeast. Our yeast likes to ferment at around 54 to 56 Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You always want to pitch a little bit warmer than you're fermenting, just so the yeast can be healthily introduced mm -hmm. and replicate to fill the container. When you say pitch a little bit warmer, yeah. the yeast itself is warm, and then you pitch it, or the you're talking about the, the, the juice. The cider, the juice, the juice itself is warmer than our target fermentation temperature. Mm -hmm. So our cidery will keep it at about 65 degrees in our space, and that will warm up the cider about two degrees per day. So we have about five days to work with mm -hmm. before we'll want to pitch, or six mm -hmm. days, because we're aiming for our cider to get up to 56 degrees Fahrenheit. We ferment around 54. And so 24 hours after adding the sulfite, we'll add pectic enzyme, and then we'll give that the remainder of the time to work. And in that time, once you get up above, you know, 45, 50, you'll start to see some wild fermentation starting to take off. Although our site is very clean, so it doesn't start as fast as a lot would. But after the beginning of active fermentation with wild yeast and 56 degrees Fahrenheit, we will rehydrate and introduce our own yeast. And from there, after a couple days, you know, you'll see the pH drop a little bit as the yeast start to replicate. And then you'll see the bricks start to drop as active fermentation begins. And then we're aiming for about one bricks of fermentation per day. You know, you can talk about having a low and slow fermentation and uh, something that maybe drives me a little nuts and a lot of people would think I'm maybe a jerk for is that people like to say, you know, there's an art to this, it's not a science. There's some stuff that you can't quantify 
and I'd like to disagree. You're on the science end I'm, of it. You're I'm, on the science end of it. I am as far on the science end as you can get. <laughs> and so you, know, you talk about a cool fermentation, and I say, well, what do you mean by that? What is a cool fermentation? What is a slow <clears throat> fermentation? And a slow fermentation to me is one bricks per day. And we try to walk our tank temperature up and down during the course of active fermentation. We'll bump it up two degrees if we slow down to 0.7 bricks per day, or we'll drop it two degrees if we're getting up to one and a half bricks per day. There's a range that we try and stick with. So, so you're really, you're like, a, a, like a helicopter cider maker. Uh, and you know, I'm talking about the, the hovering parent of the cider. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah, we, we want to yeah. be on top of this. We have a gorgeous facility, and we have the ability to do it right, so we might as well do, we'll it, do right. it right. The way you want to do it. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, if you ferment too hot, you were just talking about, like, a harsh mm -hmm. and coarse cider. And if you can smell it, it means it's evaporating out of your cider. Mm -hmm. So a hot fermentation, it yeah, it lifts a lot of that yeah. character out, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners know this already. But well, Everybody's at different levels yeah. out there in Ciderville, so it's all good news. Yeah. Good reminder, too. Yeah, sure. I don't want to blow all the volatiles out of our cider through a hot, active fermentation. And I find that hotter fermentation tend to produce more of an alcohol flavor as well mm -hmm. so and too cool of a fermentation you know the definition of cool depends on your yeast as well what its cold tolerance is ours shuts down below 52 pretty much it doesn't like to ferment very cold but a lot of them will throw like vegetal flavors when they slow down too much you'll get like that red pepper green pepper yeah, yeah, yeah. capsaicin thing which isn't always desirable unless you're trying to imitate like sauvignon blanc or something with your cider but but we aim for one bricks a day for our yeah, fermentations nice, nice. and and that means that for a cider that is eight percent alcohol you're talking somewhere around five and a half bricks or not five and a half fifteen and a half bricks mm -hmm. when you start mm -hmm. 14 and a half and so two weeks of active fermentation mm -hmm. and then fermentation stops during the last few days of fermentation uh, my background is in beer and i worked with lagers a couple times you have a diacetyl rest in lagers you let it get up to 60 degrees fahrenheit to help clean it up at the end of the fermentation and not leave that buttery popcorn flavor in there. Mm -hmm. And I've had that in some commercial ciders I've tried before, and I don't really like it too much to an extent. It can be some ciders I've had, and I've actually really liked it. But yeah. some, yeah, it, it's it's kind of unique to to it. Sometimes I don't mind it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think you know? for for like an English style cider with lower acid and higher tannin, and a little bit of that smoothness added mm -hmm. could be mm -hmm. awesome. But for this, where it's more tart and trying to be clean. Mm -hmm. I don't want to introduce what I consider that an off in there. flavor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah right. Clean is the goal for this one. Mm -hmm. And so, during we're we still talking about the spring here. Just still, a, still talking about yeah. the spring. That's okay. Yeah. So for the last third of our fermentation, once we get down to, well, maybe even a little bit past a third, but once we get down to the last like four bricks or so, we will set the jacket on the tank to 60 Fahrenheit. And our jackets, our jackets don't warm the tanks; they're cooling only. Yeah. But the activity of the yeast itself will just about get it up from that 54 degree range to 60 Fahrenheit in that mm. that few day period. And we find that that you know, theoretically will help clean up the cider. And at that point, once we hit, you know, if we actually get below zero bricks because we're going for a full dry fermentation, mm -hmm. we'll end up at negative 0.1, negative mm -hmm. 0.2. We'll drop mm. the temperature down to 45 degrees because we, we use minimal sulfites throughout the whole process. And oftentimes we don't have enough sulfite in there to prevent malolactic fermentation from taking place. With the diacetyl rest at 60 Fahrenheit, we also risk malolactic fermentation starting to take off. Mm -hmm. So I'll drop down to 45 after that to shock the yeast, prevent malolactic, and help assist in flocculation a little bit. We'll let it sit for about a week in the tank, and then we will rack off of the lees. Mm -hmm. And because it hasn't quite been three weeks of active fermentation and gross lees and everything sitting in there, mm -hmm. we really don't need to rack before that. Mm -hmm. For the most part. Right. Yep. So right. after that first racking, then we will go ahead and use finings to clarify our cider. Okay. And I want this to be shelf stable for our consumers. So after finings, we'll do a half micron coarse filtration through a 10 inch cartridge filter. And then we will do a 1 micron and 0.45 micron absolute filter to ensure sterility. And that also helps us minimize the use of sulfites to stop malolactic fermentation because if we can pretty much guarantee there's almost no population, 
then and a long shelf life. Yeah, we don't have to nuke it with chemicals. Yeah. 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 But that's that's yeah. generally the idea. But yeah. also this, we, we do sell it in a champagne bottle, and you'll notice that it's not bubbling, and the label does not say sparkling because no. it's not a sparkling cider. Yeah. But this is carbonated. So say so, more. So why, why are you carbonating it? So if if we pull this right out of the the tank when a batch is done, I it's flat. Like the flavor itself is flabby. It doesn't taste like it's tart mm, enough. Mm. But I like the balance as it is. This this is on the lower end of acidity. This is about four and a half or five grams per liter of malic acid. Once I get up above seven with our ciders, I find that we're venturing into that thin and tart territory that I don't like. Mm-hmm. So especially for a dry cider, I do try to keep the acid on the lower end, but you risk with low acid having a flabby cider. And one way that you can simulate acidity is through carbonation. Because the uh, bubbles open are... it up a little bit, lighten it up. Yeah, yeah. so we, we introduce CO2 through a carbonation stone to a very low level. We're going under two volumes of CO2, so mm-hmm. it will not sparkle in the glass and it's not legally carbonated. I thought but... I saw a couple little bob- yeah. you know, bubbles when you first gave me the glass, and I was like, okay, I was wondering what was going on there. Yeah, if we don't put mm-hmm. a champagne cork in it, it will go flat. Mm-hmm. But everybody who doesn't have this conversation with me thinks it is flat. But there is carbonation in here, and it, I would say still. Yeah, still. I would never call it flat. Sure, <laughs> it's not soda. You're right. Still. No, no that's okay. Yeah, though no, it's. I've, I've seen that word in a few emails. It's stuck in my head now. <laughs> well, still, you know, I mean, it, it's. I think also people who are learning to drink cider for the first time. We know what a still wine is, right? Yeah. You know, versus a sparkling wine, or you know, what champagne is. Um, so you know you, and. If you have a lot of bubbles, it can really mask the taste, yeah. you know? It, and sometimes people do that to mask the taste. So, um, yeah. Yeah, there's there's a consumer expectation when you pop open a bottle with a champagne cork that it will be sparkling yeah. and look like champagne. Yeah. And that's gorgeous, and I get it. But I find that when it's too carbonated, you cannot taste the cider. It scrubs the aftertaste off your tongue a little bit. And the cork is, is allowing that versus a, a crown cap... Won't do it. Won't cut it. Well, I want our ciders to have a strong shelf life, and crown caps. Um, there, well, there are two things that they can do. One is that they can let in too much oxygen mm-hmm. if they're low quality, mm-hmm. and the cider will. Well, I guess in that case we can use the word flat. It'll oxidize and it'll taste kind of wrong after time. Yeah. But if it's too good at preventing oxygen from entering the bottle, then you can get reductive character over time, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you'll get hydrogen sulfide, mercaptan, mm-hmm. disulfide mm-hmm. formation. It'll taste like car tires and garlic and onions. Right. Yeah, so a cork, they allow a small amount of oxygen exchange. They allow the cider to change its character over time and develop secondary and tertiary flavors, but you're not necessarily risking it going bad too fast or developing a reductive taint. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it also looks nice. It does look nice. Presentation, branding is very, very important. Yeah, especially You've with alcohol. You've got that going on here, too, you know? The presentation is beautiful. Yeah. And with alcohol, yeah. It's a nice, it's a nice table cider to have out there. For, we're coming on to uh, Thanksgiving time, mm-hmm. which the United States Cider Association of Cider Makers is all about pick cider for, you know, Thanksgiving. Oh, they're smart to do that, yeah. Uh, they, they sh- you know. Everybody should pick cider for Thanksgiving. Uh, yes. Even if you don't live in the United States, what, what, go pick some cider. <laughs> this is the perfect thing for people to pick up now to bring to their Thanksgiving tables. Mm-hmm. And we'll talk about an uh, exquisite cider to have with turkey. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, would that, like, cut through the gravy and... Uh, all the different rich foods that you have on the table. Yeah, really nice. And then to follow up with the frost. Mm-hmm. With the frost just, would be perfect. Yeah, it yeah, should be the whole whole meal. All right, so... Um, I, I have to ask you, where did you learn your cider making techniques? I'm self-taught. Self-taught? Yeah. <laughs> You're geeked out, man. I love it, Dad. You are like... You're, you know, I, I know this is going to provide a lot of value to all the listeners out there in Ciderville because... I appreciate you going into the detail. Yeah. That makes it really enjoyable for me. And as I get to edit, I feel like I'm getting, you know, my PhD in cider making. So I really appreciate <laughs> you offering that up because yeah. it's really valuable. And you know, we're all trying to figure it out and bringing in that perspective of, of, of your knowledge. Self-taught, you're doing pretty darn well. Yeah. Well, fortunately, and I guess part of the reason why I. I don't like sharing, but I will share is because everybody else shared with me. Mm. Yeah, it's just an awesome community in the yeah. cider world. And definitely I've read for countless hours through articles on the Internet and back when I was making beer, homebrew talk and then for a yeah. brewer and yeah. 
you know, Claude's books about craft cider making, and mm -hmm. th there's there's some awesome stuff. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. That's why I didn't say it. Who, who's that? Starts with a J. Joel oh, uh, um, uh, oh my God, Claude Jacquelet. Is that how new, new makers? Um, yeah, that one. Yeah, the uh, new cider makers handbook. I'll let you pronounce that. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. It, you know, you start with the foundation of knowledge, and you just build up over time. But there have certainly been times when I had extremely specific questions, and you write somebody like Eden Cider, and they'll get back to you. And yeah, it, you have to pay it forward. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it'd be really lonely to be the only good cider maker on the block. Yeah, and I'm not arrogant enough to think that. Uh, that that <laughs> wouldn't add value myself. at all. It's like you know, the rising tide lifts all ships. Absolutely. And that's true in the world of cider. Yeah, and you know, if, if it's if I'm so concerned that saying the words 11 and a half grams per liter of malic acid is going to tank my business, then I probably need to be making better cider. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true because, you know, it's, it's, you could give uh, the same ingredients to a group of chefs and you're going to get a very different dish. Absolutely. So, I mean, there should be no concern about that at all. No. I mean, what, what's there really to hide? Um, but it's all good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there was one other cider. Oh, for sure. There's a few more. But I don't know how much time you have. Well, uh, I've got all the time in the world for you. <laughs> I wanted to just hear about, um, we talked about the frost, the spring. And we didn't get to the summer. summer. Yep, so summer is our semi-sweet offering. And the, the fermentation profile, I'd say, is almost identical to spring. But the blend that we use is different. For the spring, I was talking about using those more heritage varieties, the Esopus Spitzenberg, the Ashmeets Kernel, right. the Wixen's Crab. They, they tend to be a little bit more tannic, some of those. And for a semi-sweet cider, like the ice cider, I don't want tannin. Because the sugar gives it the body. We don't need to back it up with anything else. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we do the 54-degree fermentation, the 56-degree pitch, the rehydration, mm -hmm. the under two volumes carbonation all of it but we sweeten it mm -hmm. and we don't have tannin and is that what sells out first it sells four times faster than spring well you know cider drinkers have to start somewhere mm -hmm. you know as a base uh, you know i got into drinking beer out of these cans that used to say generic beer there was like this period of time and that's going to like really set up my age here where everything was all in white white paper towels which said generic paper towels and I, I drank too much generic beer once and I fell in love with beer it was essentially a white can yeah. that said generic beer on it in black said, I wish I had one of those generic and it happened in Iowa as I was hitchhiking cross country so it's a generic generic that's beer fantastic. I kid you not and um, and that was my base and then and, and, you know so sometimes <laughs> generic gets you somewhere yeah and uh, sweet cider uh, well, what, uh, there's, it's lovely yeah you know lovely sweet cider who doesn't love that absolutely and people are gobbling it up and uh, I think it's a good way to introduce people to it mm -hmm. because it gets their palate savoring and wanting more oh yeah you know and then you start somewhere yeah. so sweet sweet cider tastes like people expect hard cider to taste Thank you, Chad Cook of Cider Hill Cellars in Amesbury, Massachusetts, for spending time with us today in Ciderville and sharing your wealth of information and your enthusiasm. That's what it's all about. Now, don't forget, as we are slowly ending this episode for now, to go to totallycider.com and register for that trip today that's headed to the United Kingdom. We'd be drinking lots of cider, meeting fantastic makers, and getting immersed in the culture. I can't wait, and I hope I get to spend that time with you. In the meanwhile... I'm going to keep on working on my cider and my bit of recovery with my shoulder, raising my glass in my left hand. This is Rhea Windcaller. I'm just signing off for now, and I'm looking so forward to seeing you in Ciderville. Ha! Huh.